Tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you very much, Matapihi, for the mihi. It is my very great pleasure to introduce Professor Mark Wetherall for his inaugural professorial lecture. Mark's association with Dunedin and the University of Otago began with his nativity. His parents met and married while they were both students at the University of Otago, and they are both Otago graduates, as are all four of Mark's siblings. Uh, Mark's father, Ian, was an associate professor in the Faculty of Consumer and Applied Sciences, and Mark was born in what was then known as the Queen Mary Maternity Hospital in Frederick Street, Dunedin and is now, in fact, <clears throat> the Hayward College, which is one of the university's halls of residence. After a stint in Cambridge at kindergarten and Boston at grade school, Mark eventually <laughs> returned to Dunedin to complete high school at Otago Boys High School, and then naturally he went on to the University of Otago. Clinical medicine brought Mark to medical registrar positions at Waikato Hospital and marriage to Betty. And then he went on to advanced training with John Campbell, Tudor Caradoc Davies and Wendy Busby at Wokery Hospital in Dunedin. At this time, Mark's oldest daughter was born in the same maternity hospital as Mark. There's quite a pedigree emerging here, as you'll see. Wokery Hospital was the centre of a very active geriatric medicine research program, and in particular, Tudor Caradoc Davies invited Mark to partic participate in a comprehensive survey of Parkinson's disease and its treatment in Dunedin and Moscow. After completing advanced training in geriatric medicine, Mark became a consultant geriatrician at Waikato Hospital in 1991. And at around that time, with his increasing interest in research, he began undergraduate training in statistics through Massey University's extramural program. An advertisement in the New Zealand Medical Journal prompted Mark to move to the University of Otago, Wellington in 1997 as part of the newly established rehabilitation unit with Harry Norton and Kath McPherson. His extramural experience with Massey finally came to a conclusion 17 years after commencement with a Master's in Applied Statistics and this was supervised by Professor Steve Hazlitt. Mark's research is across a full spectrum of clinical evidence, including case series, cohort studies, case control studies, randomized controlled trials, and systematic reviews and meta-analyses, and across a wide variety of clinical areas, such as neurological conditions, including stroke and Parkinson's disease, disorders affecting older adults, such as urinary incontinence and falls, rehabilitation, and the effects of common medical treatments, such as oxygen. The inaugural professorial lecture is an important opportunity to mark a career milestone, to reflect and to celebrate. It is a great honour for me now to invite Professor Mark Weatherall to come to the podium to deliver his inaugural professorial, professorial lecture, the title of which is Adding Up Evidence. <coughs> Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa, Tanakwe Kathleen, Tanakwe Professor Crampton, Tanakwe Professor Collins. Thank you all for coming to hear about some of my research. Walt Whitman said, I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I assume you shall assume, for every atom belonging to me as good as belongs to you. And this research belongs to many of the other colleagues without whom I'd have nothing to say. This beautiful beach is Aranoana, close to Dunedin. But can we rely on the evidence of what we see to understand it? It looks a lovely day, but what the blue sunny skies don't tell you, that although it's New Year and the middle of the afternoon, it was only about eight degrees. Is that true? That's true, I think, Ruth. It was cold. To the left of the picture, and in the distance, that's Taro ahead, where the Royal Albatross 
the only place in the world where the Royal Albatross nest on a mainland, on the mainland. <laughs> Across to the right, amongst the pine trees, is the memorial to those who died in the Aramoana tragedy, which is almost 21 years ago today. So there's sadness hidden in this beauty. And finally, for me, there's personal sadness in this picture. Uh, my mother and father, who sensibly wrapped up warm in their coats and left their foolish children and grandchildren to frolic in the southerly, can just be seen as a little white dot just there in the distance. Unfortunately, Dad can't be here today, but I'm glad Mum can be. And although Dad can't be here, I'm honoured to wear this tie. This is an Emmanuel College tie, which is where Dad received his doctorate in Cambridge. And this is a tie that helps bind me to Dad. For this picture, though, there's something hidden that means we can't rely on the evidence of our eyes. If you go in that central archway, you come into the beautiful Emmanuel College Chapel. And this is a picture, a glass picture on the wall of the chapel, and on the left, as I'm looking at it, is John Harvard. Emmanuel is where John Harvard went to university before leaving for the New World. But can we believe what we see? Actually, this is a picture based on John Milton, with instructions to the artist to lengthen the hair slightly. There are no known images of John Harvard. He died at age 28 of consumption, about a year after arriving in the New World, but left a legacy of either £779, if you believe Wikipedia, or £780, if you believe the Emmanuel College website, and 320 books to support the founding of a college named after him in what was then Newtown, but now called Cambridge, Massachusetts. The theme of my presentation is evidence, can we believe what we see, and trying to understand what we don't. Here is what Lord Kelvin has to say about numerical evidence. I often say that when you can measure what you are speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. But when you cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meagre and unsatisfactory kind. It may be the beginning of knowledge, but you have scarcely in your thoughts advanced to the state of science, whatever the matter may be. Are the All Blacks the best team in the world? <laughs> but how do we know? Because of SBW's torso, <laughs> Kevin... <laughs> Betty, <laughs> Kevin Mialamo's ears, Richie McCaw is a South Islander, <laughs> or because of Stephen Donald's boot? Well, we know because the final analysis was 8 7. And here is what Lord Kelvin said about a new technology of the time X rays will prove to be a hoax. Do you think? He said this with absolute zero doubt. <laughs> Luckily for this patient, x-rays weren't a hoax. This is a patient of mine uh, with a hip fracture, which is on this side. It's through the trochanteric region of the femur. Um, and this slide and the patients I deal with lead to a number of important questions for which numerical evidence is vital. Uh, of course, this patient's 86, so there are other things wrong with her. She has Paget's disease and osteoarthritis of the other hip. Is there a lot of it about? This is an important question for clinicians and others that might determine resource allocation and research effort. And we can find out if there's a lot of it about by counting what turns up in hospitals, such as hip fracture, by what is known to clinicians, such as Parkinson's disease, or by applying diagnostic tests to a population random sample, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Hip fracture is an important traumatic condition affecting about 2,500 New Zealanders a year. At present we see about 200 people a year through the Wellington Regional Hospital, 
and it's very important for my job that there are plenty of patients with hip fracture because that's what I get paid to do. In 1991-92, to 92, I prospectively reviewed all people with hip fracture presenting to Waikato Hospital in Hamilton. There were 174 people, and I related this to the population determined by the nearest census in 1991. I love hip fracture. Dame Fina Cooper, born in 1895 and who was 99 when she died, had fractured both her hips before she died, and that's despite walking the length of the country. The Queen Mother, born in 1900, who was 101 when she died, had also broken both hips before she died. I get the feeling if we all live to be 100, we'll be walking around on mended hips. These are the age-specific hip fracture rates per 10,000 population by age and sex. The rates in people in their 60s are about 5 or 8 per 10,000 100 to 250 per 10,000 in the 80s, and between 400 and 500 per 10,000 aged over 90. Hip fractures more incident in women than men, although the gap may close in the oldest old. Now, what are the implications of this for New Zealand? The population aged over 80 in New Zealand is currently about 50,000. This is going to triple over the next 20 years to 150,000. So we may expect many more people with hip fractures in hospital, and my orthopaedic liaison job's probably safe for the immediate future. Parkinson's disease is a relatively uncommon disease. The diagnosis is not as straightforward as hip fracture, as it relies on clinical assessment. And this hasn't changed since James Parkinson described the shaking palsy in 1817. His study was based on the observation of six research participants, three of whom he met in the street. I don't think things have changed very much there either, because he was a surgeon. In 1990, I was part of a team that reviewed as many of those thought to have Parkinson's disease as possible in Dunedin and Mosgiel. We identified those with Parkinson's by review of all discharge codes for the last 17 previous years, the last year's neurology department clinical records, the members of the Parkinsonism Society, all GPs were asked to give us names of possible patients, and all rest homes and private hospitals were visited and their medication records reviewed. Advertisements were also placed in the local papers. And we identified 116 people with idiopathic Parkinson's disease. The age-related prevalence rates were in relation to the 1986 census and are shown here. Similar to the hip fracture plot, there is an important increase in the disease by age. The sex difference is not as clear cut as for hip fracture patients, and of course there are very few very old men. For New Zealand, the ageing of the population means that services should be ready for people with Parkinson's disease unless there's a change in the age-specific prevalence. A very important disease, Betty, that also affects older adults more frequently than younger, is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. In this disease, there is obstruction of airflow from the lungs that is fixed as opposed to fluctuating, as is the case for asthma. Often in New Zealand, but not in other countries, it's due to tobacco smoke. A consensus definition of COPD is that the ratio of the amount of breath you can breathe out in one second compared to the total amount you can breathe out at all should be less than 70% after bronchodilator. I was lucky to be part of a team that conducted a random population survey based on the electoral roll, which contacted 2,900 people and performed spirometry on around 750 people. And this was the Wellington Respiratory Survey, which I've abbreviated WRS. And the age-specific prevalence rates are shown in this plot. This disease is very common, with rates an order of magnitude greater than those for Parkinson's disease. Rates also increase with older age, which is a cause for celebration amongst geriatricians, but not perhaps for the health system. 
In contrast to hip fracture and Parkinson's disease, though, it seems likely that these age-associated rates may change in the future as the cohort of adults who use tobacco decline. Robert Frost had thought about the ageing of the population. The witch that came, the withered hag, to wash the steps with pail and rag, was once the beauty Abishag, the picture pride of Hollywood. Too many fall from great and good for you to doubt the likelihood. Die early and avoid the fate, or if predestined to die late, make up your mind to die in state. Make the whole stock exchange your own. If need be, occupy a throne where nobody can call you crone. Some have relied on what they knew, others on simply being true. What worked for them might work for you. No memory of having starred atones for later disregard or keeps the end from being hard. Better to go down dignified with bout and friendship at your side than none at all. Provide, provide. If there is a lot of it about, what does it mean to those with the disease and what are the hidden things about the plots? Measuring associations may give information about the meaning of incidence and prevalence data. As part of the Wellington Respiratory Survey, a disease-specific health-related quality of life instrument, the St George's Respiratory Questionnaire, was collected. The questionnaire scores from zero, which is good, to 100, which is bad, based on responses to questions about symptoms, activity limitation, and emotional impact. By seeing if there was an association between health-related quality of life and the FEV1 FEC ratio, we sought evidence that the cutoff point of 70% for the label COPD was supported by a more human description of the consequences of spirometry. The technique used was locally weighted scatter plot smoothers, a method for determining approximate relationships in the setting of noisy data. Well, clearly the plot shows quite a lot of variation in health-related quality of life in this group. And clearly there are things other than spirometry that determine that relationship. However, the smoothed plot with 90% confidence intervals based on the low S procedure does show a point of inflection at about 80% ratio. And below this there's approximately a linear worsening in quality of life with worsening airflow limitation. In fact, the ratio of 0.7 is about four units different to where the St George is at a ratio of 0.8. And four units is about the clinically important difference used in randomised controlled trials of treatments for COPD. So in fact, this suggests that a cutoff point of 0.7 does in fact have a human basis. I was part of a team that conducted a randomised control trial of different forms of delivering information and inspiration to Maori and Pacific people after stroke. The information that was delivered was based on qualitative research by members of the team that suggested that role model led information was more likely to be useful for these New Zealanders. The study randomised Maori and Pacific people in a factorial design to all four of a combination of an inspirational DVD, a personal individualised assessment, or usual care. The main outcomes for the study were the mental and physical component summary scores of the short form 36, a generic quality of life instrument. As we designed the intervention with the specific needs of Maori and Pacific people in mind, we were also interested in whether a more specific quality of life related outcome could be measured. This instrument, which translates as the fruits of health, was originally designed for use in mental health care settings, but had face validity to be applied to other health care settings. The instrument has four sections, which follow one Maori conception of dimensions of health, taha wairua, spiritual, taha hiningaro, mental, taha tanana, physical, and taha whānau, family. Each dimension has four questions. Each question is rated from plus two to minus two, and a total score ranges from negative, two, negative 32, which is bad, to positive 32, which is good. 
As a particular example, the first question of the instrument asks, as a result of the intervention, do you feel more valued as a person? And we were interested in whether there was a relationship between an internationally recognised instrument and this one. This is a simple scatter plot of the score on the Hua Oranga instrument six months after the intervention in relation to the physical component summary score of the SF36 with 114 participants who completed both instruments. I haven't drawn an imaginary line on this plot as I did for the first one, but the correlation coefficient here is 0.5, suggesting there is a moderate relationship between the two. The effect of the personal intervention was statistically significant using both instruments, 1.5 point difference on the Hua Oranga instrument and six points on the short form 36 physical component summary score. Cohort studies, where a group of research participants are followed forward in time, can provide more robust evidence for associations than the cross-sectional studies I've talked about so far. I was given access to follow-up data for the ARCOS study, a large-scale identification and follow-up study that attempted to recruit all those with stroke in Auckland in 2002 and 2003. 1,842 people with stroke were studied, and at least some six-month outcomes were available for 1,259. People came from a variety of different ethnic backgrounds. The majority of those with stroke were of European background with smaller proportions and quite small absolute numbers for those of Pacific, Asian and Maori backgrounds. Now this is unsurprising as older age is such a potent risk factor for stroke and non-European ethnic groups still have quite a young population. The mean age at the time of stroke for those of European background was 77 compared to between 62 and 66 for those of other backgrounds. Uh, just for comparison, the mean age of those with hip fracture is 84, so slightly older than stroke. Now it's important to highlight that although the immediate aftermath of stroke isn't particularly lethal, a very high proportion of people are dead in the time after. In this study, nine months later, 30% of the Europeans who'd had a stroke were dead. And although not the focus of this particular study, this is likely to be related to coexisting cardiovascular disease. So on the face of it, with Europeans dying, on the face of it, they have a worse outcome. Now a disadvantage of cohort studies is that other characteristics of those who participate might determine what goes on. A more refined question might be whether there's something about ethnic background that all things being equal is associated with outcome. And the all things could include age, stroke severity and comorbid conditions. And what we found when he did these adjustments was that Asian and Pacific people were more likely to be disabled than Europeans and more likely to be at home, paradoxically, reflecting both some undetermined aspects of stroke recovery and the different social support networks as a function of age and culture. Of course, this study had other potential problems. There was quite large loss to follow up. There was differential completion of the assessment forms, including whether they had been filled in by a proxy. And there were still quite small numbers of non-Europeans leading to difficulty assessing lack of associations. Another form of non-experimental study that examines causation is the case control study. In these studies, characteristics of a group with a disease are measured, usually in retrospect, and compared with a group without the disease, but who are otherwise in some sense similar, particularly in the way they might come to the attention of the healthcare system. I was part of a team that had an interest in whether sitting around too much, computer-related work, recreational, or sitting in lecture theatres, could cause deep venous thrombosis by comparing those with venous thromboembolism with a control group with reference to their sitting behaviour. Rather imaginatively, this was called the seated immobility thrombosis sit study. In the study, the aim was to recruit about 200 people with venous thromboembolism from Capital and Coast Health and compare them to another group. And in this case, the group chosen was patients admitted to the coronary care unit. 
you'd be surprised how many ways you can define sitting. We defined it as sitting at least 10 hours out of 24, together with at least two hours without getting up, at least once in the last four weeks. I actually challenge any of you to remember if you've done that. <laughs> Secondary measurements were a variety of other ways in which research participants thought they could remain seated. We used logistic regression to estimate the strength of the association between sitting and having a venous thromboembolism. 33 out of the 197, about 17% of cases sat, against 19 out of 197, 10% of the controls, odds ratio of 1.9, with confidence intervals that were consistent with a positive association. Bet a dollar to get a venous thromboembolism, get a dollar 90 back. However, there may be systematic ways in which the two groups differ in terms of obesity and other risk factors. And after adjustment for these, in fact, we found that the risk increased to an odds ratio of 2.8. So loosely, sitting is associated with twice the risk of venous thromboembolism, all other things considered. And in the words of the famous late 20th century poet James Brown, get up off of that bang. <laughs> a weakness of case control studies is knowing exactly how similar, in the sense of being vulnerable to a condition, the control group is to the case group. And other methods of research may be more suitable for showing causality. An important method of medical research that so causes, such as treatments, lead to benefits, such as better patients, is the randomised controlled trial. In the methods of research I've described, potential causes just happen to research participants. But in randomised controlled trials, causes are definitely allocated to research participants. The randomised element means that treatments are allocated with a known probability, and that's typically 50-50, as in the toss of a coin. But no other characteristic of the participants should determine which participants get which treatments. On average, the participants are forced to be the same, unlike cohort studies and case control studies. Differences in the participants are then either due to random chance or to the treatments, and statistical analysis is used to distinguish the two processes. I find iron is quite irritating. One source of irritation for me is prescription of iron for my hip fracture patients on the basis they are anemic, as are all patients after a hip fracture appear, and that they had lost blood, so iron must be beneficial. However, how do doctors know this is helpful? Together with others, I performed a randomised controlled trial in patients having elective knee and hip replacement surgery to compare oral iron with control medication. The reason for choosing joint replacement patients is that they have a programmed pre-assessment and are relatively easy to approach for consent. Even so, we approached over 250 potential participants to recruit the 72 for the trial. Now, unfortunately, the research pharmacist got pregnant around the time I needed to start my research, so instead of a placebo, I had to give the control participants folic acid. One day after the surgery, participants received iron or folic acid, and serum levels of both of these had to be normal to enter into the trial. Ten weeks of treatment later, they had a haemoglobin measurement. Although those who received iron did on average have a slightly higher haemoglobin after ten weeks, the signal of a possible effect, the 95% confidence interval, was consistent with no effect and just unfortunately overlapped with the pre-specified clinically important difference of 10 grams a litre. After adjustment for differences in baseline haemoglobin, this was no longer the case. So iron doesn't help with haemoglobin after elective knee and hip surgery, but the participants weren't master treatment allocation, partly because of pregnancy, but partly because they had to be warned that iron made the bowel motions black, and they could have behaved differently as a result, influencing their haemoglobin. We didn't think we could ask them to shut their eyes when they were going to the toilet to blind themselves. <laughs> Is folic acid really a control? 
And are these patients really like my hip fracture patients? This piece of research was about the journey and not the destination. Well, if one randomised control trial is good, then adding the, together the results of several randomised control trials must be better. The closely related techniques for evaluating the evidence supplied by randomised controlled trials are systematic review and meta-analysis. Systematic reviews are the process of finding all available evidence that relates to a particular clinical question. Systematic review can be applied to any form of evidence, but in this context I'll present the evidence provided by randomised controlled trials. A systematic review is a census that aims to find and count all RCTs. If a non-systematic review is carried out, then this increases the chance that the evidence that is identified is a biased collection of all evidence. Meta-analysis is the method of adding the individual pieces of evidence together. Most methods of meta-analysis are by weighted sums of the numerical evidence, typically the weights determined by the precision of the individual study. Unfortunately, if the individual trials are flawed, can't be found, don't report the results, then these processes are all themselves flawed. In the early part of the last decade, expert groups from the US and UK produce guidelines for interventions to reduce the risk of falls in older adults. Both guidelines were based on systematic reviews, but neither guideline produced a numerical estimate of the effect of the interventions. The guidelines were largely based on the same papers, which is reassuring, but used slightly different ways of categorising the individual interventions. I supplemented these bibliographies by a systematic review from the end of the literature search for the guidelines to the end of 2002. And I was particularly interested in the reduction in the risk of at least one fall for those studies that had one year follow-up, and as a secondary question, whether there was an associated reduction in the risk of fracture. Odds ratios, the number who fell divided by the number who didn't, for the intervention group versus the control group, the weighted sum of these and a forest plot were used for the analysis. Eleven studies were found that reported the number of participants who had at least one fall in a year of follow-up in a multiple intervention, which was always exercise, but with another intervention versus control. Now in a forest plot, which just shows you people who do statistics aren't without a sense of humour, this axis refers to the individual studies, and this axis to the strength of association. In this forest plot, it's on the log odds scale, and that's needed to be done to convert an asymmetric picture to a symmetric picture, otherwise it's sometimes quite hard to fit it all on one graph. The lines for the individual studies are the 95% confidence interval for that study, the box is centred on the point estimate and the size of the box is inversely proportional to precision, in this case to the size of the study. And the eye is supposed to be drawn to the large precise studies which influence the pooled measurement, which is the diamond. So, this analysis suggests that a multiple intervention for older people at risk of falling results in a two-thirds risk of falling compared to usual care. This corresponds to about a 10% absolute risk reduction. For example, in Mary Tanetti's study, which is the largest study here, 47% of the control group fell in the year of follow-up compared to 35% of the intervention group, a difference of 12%. Another way of putting this is that 10 people need to have this intervention to prevent one person falling over in one year. But does reducing falls reduce fractures? Unfortunately, only two out of the 11 trials reported fractures. And although there's about half the risk of fractures, the confidence interval for the pooled effect wasn't statistically significant. Conclusion with a question mark. 
A multiple intervention, including exercise, reduces the risk of falls to about two-thirds of a control group, corresponding to an absolute risk reduction of 10%. However, there's an, there's an absence of evidence for fracture prevention, probably because of poor reporting, probably because fractures are a rare complication of falling, only 5%. Walt Whitman revised his only book of poetry many times before he died in 1892. And his final volume was produced two months before he died with instructions on it to say, this volume supersedes all other volumes. There's actually something on the University of Otago website at the moment. If you go to it and search for Walt Whitman, they've got a cabinet display of original copies of his original books, including hand-scribed changes to the poems he made for the next edition. This is from the final edition. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and the diagrams to add, divide and measure them, when I sitting heard the astronomer, when he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon, unaccountable, I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself, in the mystical moist night air, and from time to time, looked up in perfect silence at the stars. You may have some sympathy for the poet, although he probably reduced his risk of venous thromboembolism by his behaviour. However, it's important that evidence is used to determine, at least in part, how we treat people in New Zealand. We need New Zealand-led research. This is what Dennis Glover said. I do not dream of Sussex Downs or quaint old England's quaint old towns. I think of what may yet be seen in Johnsonville and Geraldine. In New Zealand, is there a lot of it about? Can we measure it? Can we apply cohort, case control, clinical trials and meta-analyses to it? Yes, but life is short. The art is long, opportunity fleeting, experiment fallible, and judgment difficult. Thank you.
ki a tau, ki a tātou katoa, te a tā whai o tō tātou ari ki a i whukaraiti. Me te aroha te atua, me te whiwhinga tahitanga ki te wairua tapu, āke, 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 āmine. Akaria mai, zori pe ka. Mauri ora. 